being from New Orleans, we have to write like that somewhat, and we have to play like that. So everything he hears is based on that. Uh, yeah, he's got um, like the traditional African styles, like you know, before you know we were brought here. So he's got a lot of those kind of rhythms and things involved in there. Then he's got it moves into the Negro spirituals, you know, which came next, I guess, and then a lot of blues, which followed that. And so he's kind of going through, you know, just the history of black people in you know in general, not just jazz. And then it, it moves into swing and all that. So it's all in there. <laughs> Blood on the fields in particular is difficult. You know, I, I can't say that anyone on my instrument could just jump up there and do it. You know, you, you have to really uh, have some things together. You have to have your instrument together. Right. That's too loud, that's too loud. Did a write a story about called Middle Passage to write a piece of music about being on a slave ship. So the whole music was just going to be about being on a slave ship. And then um, I was up at Albert Murray's house and he read a story to me by Stephen Vincent Benet, and it was called uh, Freedom is a Hard Bought Thing. And uh, it was just kind of thinking about that story and having an idea for the slave ship. I put put the two of them together, and, and I ran through it. The, just the themes that I always try to to, to deal with in, in all of my music, which is man and woman, a conception of democracy. And a friend I need Lord Jesus Do you understand Of my Well, jazz music is it's like the light bulb or the airplane. One part of the marvelous uh, boom of 20th century invention that pushed humanity to a higher level. And jazz is that in sound. So it's, a, it's the proposition, it's a musical portrait of democratic imperatives or democratic conceptions. And uh, in, I, don't, I, don't, I, only, I don't use black and white anywhere in here because I'm trying to deal with something human.
tragedy is a part of life. And uh, there are always tragedies unfolding, unfolding around us, and we all are a part of them. I mean, you know, you uh, pain is tied into perception. Slow down, dirty. suffering throughout all the ages bears down on our age and we're always looking for something that's going to help us make it through the day and the night with some style and that's what the early jazz music really has in it. On top of all of that communicating, our intent is to feel better when we get finished talking. So we're not going to be victimized by the angst of the 20th century, you know. We're not going to be overwhelmed by whatever the tragedies are of what's going on around us. We're going to recognize them and deal with them, but in the end, we're going to feel good. We're going to get us a poor boy sandwich, and we're going to come back and deal with it again. With a, with a, with a, we're going to come back reinvigorated. And uh, that's the feeling of New Orleans. Say y'all. Give me both of the parts. Yeah. Let's play through this again. This is supposed to be beautiful, bro. It... Y'all ready? Let's go. Let's go from the top. <laughs> Let's try to play the man music, bro. One, two, a <laughs> uh, one, two, three. One, two, a uh, one, mm, mm. <laughs> Some of us, we always see as destruction and death and desolation, you know, slavery and segregation and degradation. Other people see nothing but uplift, the abolition of slavery, the breakdown of segregation. That's a part of all the musicians in New Orleans. Like we all, we all related a certain way. You know, we all know each other, we see each other, we love each other, we trying to play the music, and we have our little stripe and whatever we deal with, but uh, there's not that many, many musicians, you know. In, in New Orleans, we, everybody, you studied with somebody or you grew up with them, and it's just a feeling that we have toward, toward each other. which we all have borrowed from. You know, the way that he voices chords and his approach to music, the way that he writes with counterpoint between the bass and the rest of the band. We had, this, just like everybody else's family, a lot of strife, a lot of turmoil, not, not enough money. Um, my mother and father trying to deal with their relationship. One of my brothers is autistic. We didn't sit around playing music. Like, I didn't come home and let's play some blues. It wasn't on that kind of vibe at all. You know, my mother and father were trying to deal with 
the fact that the world that they ended up living in was nothing like what they thought it was going to be. Um, but we got along. His whole life he struggled. He was trying to play modern jazz in New Orleans. Nobody come to his gigs. But more people come to see my brother and I play when we were 13 and 14 in high school playing in our funk band than would come to see my father play when he would play a jazz gig. When I was like, you know, respected Ellis Marcellus, when we were growing up, you know, he was always just scuffling, trying to get to the next gig, trying to feed all of those children. Uh, it was just a struggle for him. And I think that he went through a long period of depression, but you never would have known it because he's not, he never complains. He never blames anybody for anything. He's not the whiner. And like I said, his emotion is not in the front. But uh, the fact that he, all of this music that he loved and nobody liked it, I think that that, uh, that had an effect on him. He had excelled in European concert music and spent most, uh, just about all of his senior year in the symphony brass quintet doing concerts in the city. Uh, went to Tanglewood in the summer and Juilliard in the fall, you know. So uh, there was no real assurance that he was not going to pursue that. I mean, he had become a very good jazz player. I mean, for somebody his age. You know, he wasn't seasoned, but he was a good jazz player. At a time when virtually nobody else was doing it, especially his peers. Even now, as a grown man, you know, if my father tells me something, it, it has a certain effect on me. But I was always with him on the gigs, and like we would drive back from New Orleans to Kenner, and he would be talking to me, and I never really knew what he was talking about. So I'd just be like, mm-hmm. But he'd be lonely, you know, just he wanted to just talk to somebody and get it out of him and just have some type of dialogue. So he figured, okay, I'll talk to him. The example of discipline the example of it, you see, is something that a lot of us, we need to have so that if it's going to occur, it's something that we adapt to ourselves because we appreciate the rewards that we perceive at the end of the rainbow. Sometimes it doesn't come, but it's necessary uh, anyway if we are even going to make a run at it, so to speak, or, or an attempt. I looked up to my father, and uh, I, I think the seriousness that he approached playing a gig with is what uh, struck me, because if there would be five people in the club, he still was going to play. I got from being in New Orleans was a, was a belief in the fantastic. It's my music lessons. And my grandmother lived in New Orleans, all my family. So uh, I was always here. And, and I, for, for Mardi Gras, you, you, you mask, you know, you put your, you can be what you want to be, basically. It's just the whole ambiance of the city is, is mysterious too. So, and when you grow up here, you feel it. You can't, you can't help it. You might not be able to put it in those terms when you, when you live here, but that's what it is.
is different from other cities in the world. First, we have our own cuisine. And then all, we have people of all different nationalities, especially at that time, they were all living in New Orleans together and uh, in close proximity to each other because the neighborhoods were really integrated. And uh, when the musicians started to play jazz, the, the question was, how, how are we going to speak to each other and make up what we're going to say? You know, I've never seen someone with that type of mind where if you're playing an instrument, he can figure out how you play, you know, what, how you would sound best playing your own instrument. And he'll write the music and say, okay, play this. And you hear cats play, you say, man, that's great. So, you know, went and wrote it out. <laughs> now I think that wind is going more toward, uh, not going back to the big band, but more toward the big band type of approach where it's more of a refinement. And you have these guys who really practice and they know their instruments and then he can come along and he just, you know, get them all together and say, you know, this is what's happening. Just rehearsing uh, Jelly Roll Martin's music, Dead Man Blues, Sidewalk Blues, some Monk's music, like Break Sake and Reflections, Thelonious, a lot of different Monk tunes, and some of my own music. It's like a, like a language. It's like you take, uh, like you have rules of grammar, you have vocabulary and words. And the blues is like that with musical notes. It gives the music life. In our music, we have things, d different devices like a riff. Riffs mean that we all agree on something. We're gonna play the same thing. We have a uh, call and response. Well, look, almost all music has that in it, but that just means that I speak and you, you tell me something. solos. That means that each of us gets to express our point of view. We have polyphonic improvisation, which means that we get to talk at the same time, but try to negotiate our ideas rapidly as we go back and forth. 